and faculty. So I want to tell you what we've done at our institution. Um, my name is Tammy Waldron and I am the director of our Center for Excellence and I'm also a senior instructional designer. I've been with the institution for uh, six and a half years and so I've really seen this um, evolve over time. So I want to share everything that we've done at our institution today so you can hopefully take it home and repurpose it or um, revise it to meet your needs. I will point out that um, I do have 60 slides, but I'm not about death by PowerPoint. I am here today to share resources, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on things. We're gonna go kind of quickly on some things and then stop and have some moments for conversation as well. So these are the key components of my presentation. Of the things that we've built at my institution, um, we, have a QM implementation plan. Um, we have a master course system, which has a uh, course template. We also are a part of the Ohio QM Consortium. We have instructional design support in-house, which um, faculty development stems from. And, and we also have now started to um, embed our our policies and procedures to have QM established and kind of um, sprinkled throughout those. So I just want to get a pulse of, out of those items, which ones are the most important or most interesting to you today? So I can kind of judge how much time I spend on each of these things. Is there a limit on the number of people that can get into your Nearpod? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, I've, I've got, yeah, I've gotten a few comments that they well, say. Well, I wasn't aware of that, so I apologize. For those in the room, you can just share out. Um, and, and I'm sharing my screen for all the remote people, so they don't need to access it if, unless they want to answer the poll okay. themselves. Okay. Thank you. Faculty development, master course system, and instructional design seems to be top hit, so I'll make sure um, to spend some time to talk about those things. So moving on, um, about my institution, we're super tiny. We, um, we have a long history though. We were established in 1902 and we're a part of the Christ Hospital Network. So we um, started as a nursing certificate program and then in 2006, we became a college, and in a uh, two-year college, and in uh, 2015, we became a four-year institution. And this fall, th this is information from, um, from last spring, and this fall we launched a new program as a face-to-face -face program for medical assistance, and we have about 35 students that are launching that program. So we're predominantly face-to-face, and we're, we're pretty small. This is our course offerings per year. We, we offer uh, around 102 classes and 42 um, of those are online. So we do have two online programs, an RN to BSN program and an HCA program, and then we do have some online offerings for our RN to BSN students as well. And our RN to BSN graduation, graduation rates um, at 150% of the program length is 90%, and our retention rates are also really high. You can learn more about our institution by going to our student outcome 
this web page. I've shared these Google Slides on my presentation um, information, so you can come back to this as a resource. So just curious, what size of an institution are we working with um, in the room and, and online? some big people in the room. Kind of a sprinkling. Okay, well, as I said, I'm from a tiny place, but I think that if you um, are in a large place, you might be able to still utilize some of my resources, hopefully, and repurpose them for your institution. So when we launched um, our RN to BSN program, we started out as a hybrid, and we implemented an internal QM implementation plan right away. We had um, our administration supporting QM, and that's pretty much the foundation of what we wanted to start this program with. We hired an institution, um, not an institution, um, a company to help us build a master template system for this program. And then once that was completed, it helped it launch really quickly. And then um, we hired instructional designers to manage that ongoing. So our implementation plan has kind of evolved over time. Um, and it started just being internal and, and now it's official with, with QM and, and it continues to, to grow over time. But I am curious, like, um, where are you guys at in your implementation plan? Are you pre-contemplation or are you com contemplating it? Um, are you preparing for it? Are you in the action phase? That's where I think that we, we are at. Um, kind of in between action and maintenance at this point in the game. So here's another poll for you about whereabouts do you think that you are? We have a mic, you guys can share. You guys can share out in, <laughs> you can share out online or we can share out with our voices. Yeah. I'm also working with the nursing department, RN to BS, MSN, mm -hmm. and DNP. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping that the RN to BS is the first program to become certified. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to do it um, coinciding with their accreditation, which is in yep. 2021. So obviously it lends itself. So that's our goal. So we're mm -hmm. ramping up in 2020. Um, I just finished designing all 11 courses this year. And so by the time it gets to 2021, we'll be like in the third or fourth session for those courses. Super. So that's our goal. Yeah, nursing programs are excellent because Quality Matters is a great quality assurance tool to use and, and is great for accreditation purposes. And I've found nursing faculty are really on board for high standards. Anyone else wanna share? We're kinda all over the map, good. So this is the kind of the basis of our implementa implementation plan. Um, this is what we started with. All online faculty are gonna receive QM um, fac faculty development with the APP QMR. And as we got approved at the state to do an IYOC, then now I allow both either or as their foundational QM training. And in 2007, we moved from um, internally reviewing to officially reviewing. As the school grew and we had more online classes, it became really hard to do internal reviews. And the time then it took to do that, and it's so easy being a part of the Ohio Consortium to do official reviews through the bartering system. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We uh, decided to move in that direction and, and it's going really well. So 
So we offer a QM workshop every May and then upon request. So it's not very often to some big institutions, but we're so small, we have 40 faculty, 80 total. Um, and it, that's meeting our needs. And then in addition, we are surrounded by institutions that are part of the consortium and our, our membership, we can go to those for free. So anytime there are some in the region, I share that out with my faculty so they can go. And we have 100%, 100% of our online faculty have taken uh, Quality Matters training and it's, it's um, required for our, our full-time faculty, but it's optional for our adjuncts and we still have high um, numbers for our adjuncts going through Quality Matters training as well. In addition, like I had showed you earlier, we're predominantly face-to-face -face. Um, and we have face-to-face -face faculty going through QM too. So I think that speaks really highly to how much we honor and, and value the QM training and the process at our institution. So we started official reviews in 2018 and with the goal of doing two a semester. And we currently have nine courses officially have met QM standards. Um, last spring, it's gaining traction. So we received requests to actually complete um, four in the spring and summer. So it certainly is getting word of mouth and um, gaining a lot of support and traction. So some of our uh, internal initiatives and incentives for doing the QM review, um, we've, we have a QM website that has um, our own personal success stories. So everyone who goes through an official review process, we invite them to write up a story to share out how that process impacted them. And we also were highlighted um, in August in the QM newsletter, which um, some of those success story quotes were put into the newsletter. So uh, Professor Ryan states, I must admit, I was nervous going into the QM review process. While I had gained a lot from my experiences in previous QM workshops, I was nervous about those items translating into a review of a course that I had designed. I'm still surprised by how much I've learned through the QM process. And Professor Kalmeyer states that preparing my lifespan development course for a quality matters review was the kind of deep work that helps me grow as a professor. Because the rubric is based on standards, I knew the specific goals I was aiming for. The process required lots of work, but it wasn't frustrating. From my experience, Quality Matters is the kind of essential reflection, best practices, and review from expert educators that truly improves teaching and learning. This lifespan development course now provides a better learning experience at the college, and I have a more clear and organized way of approaching online course design. In addition to that, we also send out a college-wide email. They're in the alumni newsletter. They get a QM mark on their nameplate in front of their office. We give them a, their certificate framed. Um, we put the QM mark in their course banner. And then one of the biggest incentives is student feedback. So we have students emailing their professor just out of the blue to tell them, your course is really organized well. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm having such a good experience with how you've designed this course, which is like we don't prompt that feedback. It's just what students are reaching out to tell us. So that lets us know that we're on the right path. This is an example of what our banner looks like. We use Blackboard. And the courses that have gone through QM, we keep those um, open. So we're, we have a master. Um, template system and our faculty share openly with each other. So once they share out, they've gone through the QM review process, other faculty are asking, can I see your course? So we get them logged in so they can see the examples and, and then they can um, learn and grow from that, which is really awesome. So moving question. on to our, yeah. Just, just, uh, are yes. all the course, all your online courses, this is a question from online, are yeah. all your courses on, um, have to go through QM certification? That is in our implementation plan and we're working towards that. Yep. Good, any other questions before I move on? Okay. 
This is an example of um, one of our templates. This is for our HCA program, healthcare administration program. Um, so I, I spoke that we originally hired a company to build our template for us. And as we have um, gotten more and more reviews, and we've reviewed internally, then we have improved that template. So when one course goes through an official review, it actually impacts the template institutional-wide. Um, and every class, face-to-face -face and online, uses the template system. So even our face-to-face um, -face courses are, are using a robust template. So this is an area where I'm gonna go really quickly, because I know you can't see this information, but I wanted to, sh so that you can go back and look at this as a resource, um, see some examples of what we do in our, in our courses to embed quality matters in to the template so that the faculty can then focus on content and, and have that in place to know that they're meeting those standards. So we have a start here page, and then we also um, encourage faculty to send out a welcome announcement. In the start here, we have several sections that go into making the instructions clear and um, where to find the course components. And then also the required technology skills that our students need to be successful. The syllabus page is another easy place to hit a lot of the QM standards. Um, so you can come back and look at this as a resource. This is one area of the, um, let's see. Um, the grading policy was one area that came up a couple of times in our QM reviews that we were able to, to really learn from. We, um, we have categories and percentages in how we grade our students overall in the course, and um, our reviewers in multiple courses kept saying, you need to add the points to the problem, our points don't necessarily add up to the percentages, so that's why we have left them out. Um, especially like, well, I mean, in our face-to-face -face courses and the nursing courses, they're high stakes and, and they have a lot of assignments that aren't worth a lot of points. But, but I, I value that and, and it's um, an example is, is present there for you to look back at, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, any of these pages, or is it something that you send back to the instructional designer? Mm -hmm. um, the question, the full question was, are our faculty able to edit these pages? Ab absolutely. It's a guideline for the faculty. Um, there are certain links that we, that are institutional that don't impact the college, the course or the content. So if I um, scroll back. Um, we ask that they keep some of these in, like faculty information. We ask that they have um, communication policy and the support items, helpful tutorials, accessibility, accessibility, college policies, and procedures and student resources. So uh, those are part of our institutional template that stay consistent throughout. And there's really no um, course content information in there. Um, it just aids their students. So we don't, we don't get pushback about that at all. Um, there's tons of academic freedom in implementing a course template program because it's the course content and how you teach that material and what you're teaching is where that comes in. Just a quick question yeah. on that. Um, do you have issues with faculty like accidentally deleting some of your <laughs> components or are altering them? Because I, I do know that there's been uh, concerns with templates at our campus with making things that might be too complicated that if they alter them in some way, they can't unalter them. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious if you have certain kinds of instructions or if that's an issue you'll run into. Yep, and I was going to get to that in a little a while, but that's okay. I can talk about it now too. Um, 
we're tiny, so they can come to my office if they have a problem. But all of our courses have a dev template, and then this live semester courses are copied from that. So if they accidentally delete something, they can go back to the original one to see what was done. The question is, did they know that they did it or not? Um, and 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 that, that's an area of um, concern for us too, because we're not in there monitoring and there's no tracking system to know if something got deleted or something didn't get deleted. Uh, so we do have a course lead system where a lead faculty is in charge of the course and then they, they help mentor and guide other faculty that are teaching their courses because that's another huge area of concern for leading a master um, template program is that it's kind of confusing to, to get a class that you haven't developed and what do you do and if you get it like at the get it late um, if you even if you get it early still it's a lot of information to know and what do you do and what you, don't you do so we have provided guiding support resources to help people with that that I'm sharing with you today um, in addition there's that mentorship piece um, that is an area of becoming an area of concern for us too as we grow. So there are certain courses that are general eds and because we don't have a lot of faculty, um, it's the, there's not a designated course lead for every single one of that little pocket of courses. And so some of our adjuncts who have been teaching over and over again, then they become more familiar with the courses as they, as they teach. But um, that's something that's on our radar that we really need to get a handle on. Um, because then you can be giving courses out that actually aren't ready. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Any other questions? Um, as I stated, we have a college policies and procedures that links to our college catalog um, from the course. And then we put in the course the, um, privacy and accessibility policies that are applicable to institution. And we do ask that the faculty put in ones that are in addition to their courses. So th these are examples from my course. So I teach with Pearson, so I've added those here. And this is an example of our module page. Um, so these things do come in the template. And if faculty don't take out the instructions, then that could be awkward. <laughs> and that, you know, I mean, it sometimes happens or they forget to hide things. So there, it's really important to have that mentorship and that training. Um, and we are fully accessible. The instructional design staffer help help this, the faculty through that. Some, some faculty, we have a spectrum of faculty that, that work. Some are fully functional and do everything by themselves and some are not and we do everything for them and, and that's job security for us. And it's our role, it's our purpose. So sometimes faculty come and say, I'm so sorry I'm asking you to do this. And I'm like, but that's my job. <laughs> my job is to help you be the best faculty member that you can be. So please ask me for help. And it's better when you ask me for help ahead of time than after because then we can avoid problems and with students or, or whatever. So we um, have mod module introduction, the learning outcomes, what the students are supposed to do, and then the learning activities with the links out to the tools is, is typical for our modules. And again, um, every course has a faculty information page where we can share out our communication policies, how to contact us, when our office hours are, et cetera. We're currently running Blackboard SAS, which is the old Learn platform. So we have top tabs. We are um, gonna be moving to the Ultra platform, but maintaining our Learn classrooms. So I'm not exactly sure what that's gonna look like. I don't know if anyone has done that. If you have, please talk to me, because I'm just curious how that worked out for you. I'm hoping that it can, um, can work. So right now we have a lot of QM standards met by our top tabs, but those are gonna go away. So we have our help 
to technology help. We also have an accessibility um, link that students can go to to get directly to our student support services. We have a whole page dedicated to what they can do to be um, successful and what they can reach out to. So we have a student support services called Impact that's 24 seven help for them. And Impact has informed us that our students use their, utilize their services more than any other institution. So we're doing a really good job at sharing that information with our students. And overall, um, having a consistent template just minimizes cognitive load for your students. So as they go from course to course, they know where to get information and they don't have to relearn the system. It's so helpful and we've received that feedback from our students and I think it takes out cognitive load from faculty as well because they don't have to think so hard about um, what they're doing but how they're going to do it. Question? Hold on, let's get the mic so the people remote can, can hear you. Thank you. Um, have you tested your template in mobile and do do your students use mobile? Mm -hmm. Do some of the graphics operate differently mm -hmm. in mobile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, SAS, Blackboard Learn doesn't play nice with mobile devices and that's why we're moving to the Ultra platform. Um, so and no, Blackboard doesn't work nice with that. And that was that's a part of the um, company that we hired. So there are some things we're going to have to change. And we've been working to change some of those things that the company um, provided for us. There was some accessibility issues that they provided that got kind of, mm -hmm, the company that provided the template. Mm -hmm. So we've been kind of like cleaning those up over time too. Yeah. So you have really nicely identified in, in the parts of your template what standards are met. Mm -hmm. Do you relay that to your faculty? Mm -hmm. um, do they know? bit by bit what the template. I think we could do a better job at that um, because everyone's taken the APP QMR. I think we have assumptions that they know what's going on. Um, but I think that's an area that we could really grow and I've learned some things here this week that I'm gonna take back. So that's, that's excellent feedback. Other question? If there's one from the yeah. Uh, how do you get faculty buy-in for Cube initiatives across different departments? Uh, and how do you, so how, I guess that's what you sort of mean. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. How do we get buy-in for? From the faculty to do, to do this work, I believe. Mm -hmm. just, just in general, just to adhere to the master template? Yeah. You can skip it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I can still speak to that because uh, we don't have a problem with that. Um, I think our faculty recognize that this is, this is better for the students. We are a teaching institution and I think they appreciated the help. When we launched the RNWSM program, we moved from Angel to Blackboard and so when we used Angel, it was a repository of documents. It really wasn't a learning management system. Um, or an online course with information and faculty just didn't really know what to do or how to use it. And so they looked to us um, as experts in helping them to best design their courses and, and they really just came on board. And, and we didn't necessarily force the face-to-face -face faculty to utilize this template in their course. It's not mandatory, but they wanted to do that because it's a great template and why not follow that and make it best for their students as well. It helps them organize their content and we, um, even our fully face-to-face -face courses use an online platform a lot because we have our students doing assignments before class to come prepared and after class when they leave. So we definitely utilize this template across the institution. Other questions? So I spoke about this a little bit in that we do have course leads supporting this structure. And then we also, we, every time we were um, fielding questions, we started to compile that into information for, to, to have a repository for people to go back to. And that's the Blackboard component. So people online, um, I'm gonna show the Blackboard components here and you can click on that Google Doc to access this document. 
or it will show perhaps through the video. So we were building questions and creating little in time tutorials and we've compiled all of those into this document, which is specific to our institution and our template and very specific to Blackboard. Um, but perhaps it can be helpful if you use a different platform, but talking about um, the things that you need to be aware of, in addition, just good teaching, making sure um, you're adhering to copyright and ADA, different compliance information. I'm gonna share this a little later, but universal design, we've done symposiums on this and internally have created a checklist to help guide faculty to be accessible in their courses. And then we have a writing across the curriculum initiative. And so um, this, uh, a writing assignment should be included in, in every course. And we have uh, online tutors available for our students as well. And then getting into what you need to do in your course to show your presence, how do you navigate through your course? Because faculty do have full accessibility to make changes, but um, all technology is easy once you know what buttons to push, but Blackboard's kind of clumsy. So, and there are multiple ways to do things and which is the best way to do things is kind of hard. So we've gone through and, and kind of compiled this for them to hopefully be a good resource that they can come back to, to utilize for their course content and the course tools. Another thing we did is the live course checklist, which um, kind of gives faculty, uh, highlights the things that they need to pay attention to in their template to make sure that they do change it or update it or look at and make sure it's operating and functioning. Sometimes things break so it's a, a, a good checklist to make sure your course is ready to go live. Oh, I went to the wrong one, sorry. Okay. We also added specific questions to our student surveys to ask about their online experience that I think dovetail with um, what Quality Matters is looking for. And our satisfaction rates are really high. Um, students are really happy with the experience that they're receiving in these courses. And the fact that they're consistent across um, their program is really, I think, helping this. So do you guys, um, Here's another poll opportunity. Do you utilize master template system? And, and do you wanna take a minute and share what you're doing? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Certain programs use a master template system. It depends on, it's not system-wide across mm -hmm. the university. Um, but we use Canvas, and there are, is like um, an option in one of them to have like you can lock pages so it can't yeah. be edited, yeah. which sometimes addresses that issue of someone changing a, you know, a QM standard. Mm -hmm. Of course, some things need to be open so that it can be personalized, mm -hmm. um, but it depends on what we have found and one of our challenges is it depends on like the dean of that college. Yes. What buy-in do they have? Mm -hmm. So we have not a consistent mm -hmm. anything. <laughs> right. It, it's all kind of housed in, in different departments. Sure. I think that's a benefit of us being so small. I think once you get big, it's hard to do that. Exactly. Yeah, everyone is like literally like in separate spaces. There's um in the back table and the front table. So we're actually, we're actually moving in this direction. We have both the individual sections, but we've done a lot with master courses. So it's less of a template where they have that freedom, although they have some freedom. It's more of a lockdown structure. 
and I think they're starting to move towards the template. So the, the documents that you just showed of the checklists and the instructions, I think, go a long way to taking and morphing into that mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And where we've sort of towed the line is if it's a if it's a master course, it's one review for the one course and everybody does the mm -hmm. same. But when you go to a template, if there's multiple sections, then they each need to go through and do their own review because they can, and it sounds like what you do, they take the template, they, they tweak it a little bit, yeah, and, then there's, yeah, yeah. and then there's a review, eventually there may be a review. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if they make changes, then it needs to go through a separate review and they can't hold the mark. Mm -hmm. the, the checklist is, is password protected? Uh, it should not be, it should be, it should be fully accessible. Okay, so maybe it'll be open later. So yeah, it shouldn't be. So I'll look into that. Yep. Please email me if you have any problems accessing these documents, but I'll look into all of the links that I provided. We do use a course template system for all of our online course developments campus wide. Um, but I don't think we've done a good job of communicating to faculty why there's a template and how it meet, meets each of those standards. And so they do sometimes go in there and they're like, I don't like this yeah. and gut it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, that's really a takeaway for me here is that we need to communicate that clearly to our faculty so they understand the philosophy behind it. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, yeah. thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, it's, it's true. You get so busy and then you get people added, like especially adjuncts at like the, the day before classes start, how do you communicate to them? So I am gonna talk about what, one thing we do is our multi-section policy that they have to sign off on, that they understand these are things that you can change, these are things you can't change. I went to a session yesterday from Quality Matters and they're um, starting to build a conversation around um, the um, teaching, the teaching aspect of the rubric and it, the way that they're approaching it and designing it, it's like a rubric for people who are teaching certified courses that didn't actually develop them. And I find that is a fantastic direction for us to go in because it ties, it talks about what they should do to facilitate the class and what um, course design standard that links to so they can understand when they're making changes how that impacts the certification of the course. Um, it's not ready for, to be launched, it's just in its infancy, but I think that's the direction that Quality Matters is going and, and I fully support that and appreciate that. I'm gonna take this information back though and get things started now too to better communicate this information to, um, to the faculty at, at, as a whole, but also adding information to when we assign these courses to people, why it's important and what are the components of it. So this is what we've already been doing is kind of sharing out um, what we what you do and perhaps there are some people online that can help add to this conversation on what you're doing um, in your institution to to help embed quality matters into your courses so i apologize for not bringing this forward sooner I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward and then we can come back to this at the end. So talking about policies and procedures, what are we doing to embed this into actually our system? So I'm going to open up the document request for instructional design services. So um, we were the first instructional designers on campus um, and I didn't realize that people didn't know what instructional designers were. So, and then I came to be a part of the Quality Matters and understood that's actually pretty common. So I took about the first two years to market what we do. And um, this is a document that came out of that really describing what can an instructional designer, designer do for you. We wear a lot of hats, but I was, we were predominantly looked at as tech support and helping them like be worker bees in their class, but not necessarily helping them to brainstorm the best way to teach things and to enhance learning in their classroom. And 
Um, these conversations have really helped to push us in that direction. One of the first internal reviews that I did, I got strong feedback. I was new to the institution and then we're doing these internal reviews with a lead faculty and, and she was, she came, I mean, my interpretation was she was a little offended that I gave feedback to her class. Like, um, if you're stepping outside of your role, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So not only is my credentials that, like my whole credentials are education and, and learning, instructional design, but in addition, it's QM. That's what we're taught to do in the Quality Matters Review. And, and I feel like that is what gave me um, the leg to stand on to say, like, I'm, I'm giving helpful recommendations and that's what Quality Matters asks us to do. And, and now she's my biggest advocate. It was just not understanding the roles and being very clear in those roles helps to build relationships and communication and just enhance courses. Because if you can work together on courses, they're better than if you're working in a silo. We also put together a course alignment map that helps faculty when they're building their courses or if they want to go back to give them a structure. It's a, it's a table. And, um, and then also, hmm, I thought it was here, but um, also this um, content expert and ins instructional designer agreement, which needs to stem from the dean. We don't have authority to ask people to do this, but when you're asking someone to create a course and you're putting it in the, in the registration for students to sign up for it, it should be fully developed. And we, getting courses um, requested and programs launching in a very short timeline doesn't help to support our cause at all. And so our recommendation is two semesters ahead and I have an example that shows all the things that you would be doing each week and should be doing each week in order to get a quality course built to allow time. Just you need so much time to think about things and, and for me when I'm building out, I might get halfway through and think of something and circle back around. So you need to have that iteration that you will lose if you're building a course while you're teaching. So we advocate heavily for that. And this is just an example of all of those components and phases that a course development goes through and you need to take into consideration when you're launching new courses and new programs. Um, as I stated, we, we certify the one course and all courses that then are copied from that in the sections do adhere to our multi-section policy and it's very clear what they can change and can't change. They are welcome if they, it's appropriate and, and approved by their dean to make changes. Um, but if they do make changes that are approved, they cannot hold the, the certification mark in their course. They'll need to go through the review themselves, which they are encouraged to do. And then we also have a faculty evaluation policy that 33% of that policy is about an annual self-review and an annual peer observation. And this is across the board for online and um, and face-to-face -face courses and and I um, we build out an online hybrid teaching tool to help support the faculty with that and QM is definitely a foundation of this um, documentation and I look to the research on what are the best practices of what you can do in your course to help in the four categories of instructor presence engagement and innovation community building and facil facilitation and implementation. And so I've provided a lot of examples of what you can do. Obviously, this isn't a checklist, you do them all. It's what's applicable to your course content and what's in your style as, an, as a professor and as an educator. In the interest of time, I'm gonna um, skip by this. Internal professional development. So we've just launched a center for excellence, which is really exciting to have 
um, a goal of having centralized funds and more sustainable professional development. Uh, I, we have the goal to align with policies and practices for rank and promotion and um, teaching outcomes. In the past, we've put on accessibility symposiums, curriculum development, um, ed tech tools. We have an online em employee orientation that I think can be bolstered. And, um, and there's so many things that we can add with the center now that I'm really excited about. And the UDL checklist is something that I, um, that I developed uh, for the symposium that, that's there for you to look back at. Um, there's information on here about the consortium, but we're at five minutes, so I'd like just to say that I could not do what I do without being a part of the Ohio consortium system. They've enabled me to get professional development, and we do um, our online official our official reviews through the barter system, which is just fantastic. So if you don't have a system, you should reach out to our system and try to get one started in your state. So I'd like to open it up for questions before we get out of here today. Yep, how to access these resources after the presentation. I have given you my Google Slides, which I'm running from. They are on the presentation site from QM, and it has all the links and all my slides. I would assume that it's both. Uh, the, the, if you go to qualitymatters.org, uh, events and then there's a link that says conference presentations and then you can um, go and access access in there and I'll put that link in the people online so they can see it too. That's my contact information as well and I have um, business cards if you'd like them please reach out to me and email me I'm more than happy to field questions and give you my two cents on um, if you're having issues at your institution, perhaps things that I've learned can help you. I'm really glad I could come here and share my resources with you. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>